I'll just begin by acknowledging that we are all joining on Aboriginal land and we pay respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging and extend this respect to any Aboriginal colleagues here with us today. We acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. My name is Carolyn Davies. I'm a Senior Project Officer at the Centre for Excellence. I'm joined by my colleague um, Emma and a guest who I will introduce in just a moment. Um, the webinar that you're viewing today is part of our Aveth in Context series, which is a series of interviews, presentations with professionals in different fields, exploring the different contexts of um, of young people using violence in the home and their families. Um, a quick note on language, you will notice that we avoid using labels such as offender and perpetrator when talking about the behaviour of children and young people, so we do tend to use the language um, adolescents or young people who use violence. Our guest today is speaking from the perspective of the mental health system. We have spoken previously on the topic of mental health service utilisation, where we heard that for young people using violence against either family members or within intimate partner settings, um, that these young people were potentially 1.8 times more likely to engage in violence if they'd had a mental health engagement in the last three months, um, which seems to indicate to researchers we spoke to that there is a clear lead up indicated by um, mental health contact, meaning that mental health services are a clear point of intervention. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Michelle Coho. Michelle is an Evaluation and Research Development Officer with Alfred Health in the Southeast Melbourne area. She has an extensive background in psychology and evidence-based interventions. In 2021, Michelle and colleagues published their paper on responding to Aveth, a community mental health approach, and we'll pop that link into the chat there if you'd like to view that. Um, there will be a content warning on our discussion today, as it does contain descriptions of violence used in, in the case studies that are presented. So please do reach out for support on the numbers um, listed in the chat if you if you do want some support around that. Um, just very briefly on housekeeping, there will be time um, hopefully at the end for some questions after the presentation. If you do have any questions that you would like um, answered anonymously, you can pop those into the Q&A box. Um, today's session is being recorded. That's always our number one <laughs> question. Um, if you are having any technical issues in terms of sound or whatever, do try logging out then logging back in again, or you can contact Emma Nugent in the chat function to try and see if she can help. Um, okay, that's, that's my spiel done. Without further ado, I will now pass over to Michelle and um, Michelle, if you'd like to, are you able to share screen or share slides? Um, thank you for inviting me along, Carolyn and Emma. Um, it's um, with great pleasure I um, come to you today to present um, adolescent violence in the context of the mental health services. There's actually two parts to the presentation that I'll be um, offering you today. Part one is looking at a scoping project that we did in 2019 off the back of that, that paper was published. But I'm also going to give you a review of our community forensic youth mental health service, um, which actually does cover the whole of Victoria. And I did an evaluation on that. Um, oh gosh, now it's testing my memory a couple of years ago. So I'm going to give you the results of that as well. But the first part is having a look at a scoping project that was actually funded by, um, God, before I go into that, I'll just cover who, who I am, who we are. So Alfred Child and Youth Mental Health Services, um, like any Kings and Camps services, a tertiary mental health service, 
we have a bit of a strange catman, catchment for the Alfred. So um, although we cover a lot of the Bayside areas, it's um, the age ranges change depending on where the catchment is. Um, we also do have our Youth Forensic Specialist Service, which sits and is embedded within our Kim service, which is pretty unusual to have a forensic youth mental health service. Um, but I'll talk about that more in a, late, a bit later. So the first part on the current project I'm going to talk to you about is this scoping project, which was funded by Equity Trustees. So this was in 2009, and at the time, Equity Trustees um, wanted to put some money into trying to find out and discover more about adolescent violence um, in the home. And then with the plan um, that we would get funding to actually run that program. So it was a six month scoping project where we did a desktop search and literature review on what was currently available. We did extensive consultations, which I'll go through with you, and we ran a co-design workshop. We did secure funding for uh, to get this program up and running. That was until 2020 when COVID appeared and all the money went into COVID as opposed to getting this program up and running. So um, nothing really has much changed since that particular point in time. I'm not going to go through um, the details on what adolescent violence is, because I think most people in the audience here will be familiar with what constitutes adolescent violence. And I think most people will also be aware of what the extent of the problem is with respect to adolescent violence. So what I really want to cover is what we actually did in this project. So before we actually went into our workshop, I conducted one-on-one -on -one consultations with a huge variety of stakeholders, asking them pretty much these questions. Um, and that was around most of the east and the southeast suburbs of, um, of metropolitan Melbourne. Um, so we wanted to find out about their experiences of working with adolescent violence. Um, also the types of services that there were or were not in the area and what they thought was needed. So I did about 20 or 30 consultations and they covered, for example, um, Moorabbin Magistrates Court, which is close uh, was within our catchment, uh, huge amount of consultations with Youth Justice um, in the southeast, um, the then Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Education I went and spoke to. We also did, I spoke to um, NGOs, so Anglicare, other health service providers such as Peninsula Health, uh, family violence practitioners, Orange Door clinical staff, we, we covered as basically as many people as we could to try and get feedback. So what we did with that feedback then was develop this workshop um, to again further elaborate on um, what we needed to do and what the ideal service would look like if we had the funding to be able to do it. So when we went into the workshop, we were asking people to think about what would a good outcome look like if we developed um, an initiative or a program for such a service and how might we measure success of that service? But we also wanted to understand what, had, what was currently being helpful because there's obviously no point in reinventing the wheel and also the tools and activities and resources that we may need. So to give you an idea of the people that attended that workshop, I think we had about 40 um, attendees. Um, so again, there was um, Department of Health representation, um, Alfred staff. We had um, parents who had been the victim of adolescent violence. Um, we had academics from Monash Uni, Orange Door, and then the not-for-profit, so Anglicare, Jesuits Family Life. We had quite a good representation from um, Victoria Police, um, from Paran and Morabam. Um, youth Justice, Child Protection, Department of Education, Task Force, Legal Representatives, um, Murabin Court Representatives. So we had quite lengthy um, consultations with Magistrate and Goldsboro for those of you in that area. And we also did have young people attend that had um, been um, using adolescent violence in the home but had since um, stopped or they'd grown out of it. Um, so they were also within that workshop. So what came out of the workshop was that um, it's really complicated, really complicated. And for many reasons, um, sometimes some believe there were too many options in managing this, not enough options. There's a huge variety of services. Um, so it's sometimes trying to narrow down the right service. The approach also needed to be tailored. Every young person had a different story. So that's why it needed to be tailored because we couldn't get a, a 
one box or one size fits all box. Um, the behavior could vary hugely as well. And there were um, many solutions to, to this situation. So this was, I've got a couple of case studies here. This was one of the parents that attended the workshop. So this was, she had a son with um, an intellectual disability. And these are her words. So her son having her in a chokehold. And then when she looked, looked up, she could see that her little eight-year-old daughter had a golf club and um, about to knock out the son to get the son off the mum. And that at that point, she knew that she had to do something. So um, at the time I actually spoke to her, she was actually sitting at the court waiting for a family violence order against her son. Um, and she believed that he would kill her, even if it was not necessarily premeditated accidentally because he had an intellectual disability. Um, but she knew that it was really complex and she couldn't, um, she couldn't help him and she couldn't help him to get his needs met. So for her, it was a huge amount of frustration. The next mum was um, a 53 year old divorced mum with two teenage boys. So her ex-husband was violent, um, including physical, emotional, um, all the characteristics of family abuse. But for her, her son, um, her son perpetrated the same sort of violence um, against her that they had seen the father do. But she struggled to gain access to services because of the complexity of being in a, um, a, a divorced couple. Um, and feeling isolation and then struggling with child protection, police, court involvement um, through the family court, as well as domestic violence issues. So again, a really, really complicated case and she was really, really struggling. So I guess these are just some of the challenges that we found that came out of the workshop. Um, and this list is, um, there's probably quite a lot more to this list than what we've got here. And I'm sure you're very familiar with a lot of the issues here. Um, what we did find is that for young people with intellectual disability or ASD, it wasn't about power and control like a lot of the other um, adolescent violence or young people that, that have adolescent violence. Um, the police, we also found um, there was a lack of, the police were quite frustrated because there was a lack of um, services that they could actually take these young people to when the parents phoned them at 10 o'clock at night because the young person was um, being violent. They had nowhere, nowhere to take them there was, they, other than the police station. And their belief was that um, the longer they held that young person at the police station, it really could be a make or break situation for that young person, whether they would get buy-in from that young person. So it was really difficult for them to try and engage these young people. Um, some of the other issues that I think most of you are probably aware of is the joint IVO situation where the young person has the IVO against the parent, the parent has the IVO against the child. Um, lots of disengaged families, a huge amount of stigma. Some of these young people were also couch surfing or homeless teenagers, or the grandparents became the carer. Some of the young people were dropping out of school as young as grade six. Um, some of the other issues that we came across were young people were um, gaming all night and then becoming violent when the parent um, tried to cease that online activity. Um, and also the marital not being suitable for adolescents. So again, that's just a summary of some of the issues which um, I've sort of covered for you. And these are some of the programs as well, which I'm sure most of you are aware of. So the challenges, um, so a summary of the challenges identified for establishing um, an adolescent violence in the home program was the need to address the stigma, needed to be flexible with outreach, um, young people needed to be group ready and that was most definitely a challenge we found. Um, many of them had an undiagnosed or unaddressed mental health issues. Um, some of them it's around inclusion and exclusion criteria and what, when or how they could be involved, whether or not a program should be mandated or not. Um, low levels of literacy in these young people, low levels of language and comprehension in particular, those with an intellectual disability. And then also sometimes the parents lacking the skill to know actually what to do with their young people. 
So I'll go through the actual um, model of care in a moment that was proposed, but the recommendations were that um, what was really needed for these young people was an intensive case management approach, most definitely an outreach approach, so meeting young people where they're at. Also group work. So at Alfred um, Headspace, we have something called Discovery College. And so we felt that that would be a good way to engage young people, which is um, very much along the basis of a recovery college, for those of you that are aware of that. But we also identified there was a specific need for intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorders um, because it does manifest itself slightly differently in those young people compared to other young people. But our other aim was to make sure there was very early intervention. So identifying those families that were at risk um, because perhaps there had been um, violence in the home and to try and intervene before the young person then um, started using violence themselves if it was an intergenerational issue. So our target population for what the proposed program was um, the at risk. So as I mentioned, the very early intervention and we decided through the findings of this workshop that those would be um, young people that have disengaged at school, um, deemed it being a risk of violence. Um, there was a potential for an L17 report or a police warning. And also those with um, complex needs. So we, we had sort of like three categories, which again, I'll show you in a moment, of, of how we sort of saw these young people, um, and which is what came out of the workshop. So those with um, active adolescent violence, uh, those involved with youth justice, subject to the criminal um, process, and also having a current IVO. So this is how we saw what our potential referral pathways would be from um, the left, so the least, um, the very early intervention, I guess, right up to the needs a lot of intervention um, to try and cover, and bearing in mind, this was 2019, so some of the names of these possibly may have changed since then. Um, the name we came up with was, um, and I'll show you what the acronym means in a moment, Safe and Positive Interactions, and it would go through an intake team but obviously quite a wide variety of um, potential referral pathways. So this probably looks really complicated um, and it did take quite a while to sort of draft out what this type of program would look like. So the name of the program we came up with was Supporting Adolescents and Families Engage in Positive Interactions. So you can see there's two main arms to, um, to that. Um, the first was the early intervention or the at risk. Um, and we felt that this could be young people that um, there was a school report of violence or family at risk of, um, or had a history of family violence, maybe a parental concern or the child with an intellectual disability or on the autism spectrum um, showing signs of violence. And then we've got the later intervention, which was actually responding to violence after it had occurred. So being the issuing of the L17s, youth justice involvement and so on, as I mentioned. So the approach that was decided upon was to commence with a focused family session initially. The thinking being that sometimes, especially for the early intervention and at-risk families, an intense focused family session potentially might be able to put families back on track without the need for more intense intervention, but also acknowledging the fact that that may not always work for everybody. And it may be that that particular family doesn't fit into the remit of what we were trying to achieve. So management of care therefore being sort of passed on to potentially other services. So um, some of the non-government organisations, it might be discharged from care because the one session was enough might be brief intervention, it might be case management, which included outreach and then intensive case management um, and a care team to follow that young person, which we felt at the time would potentially be um, at least 12 to 18 months, if not longer, because often by the time they get to that stage, they need quite a bit of work to be able to um, resolve some of the issues. So with the intensive um, case management, we felt that that would include family therapy, um, safety and well-being, um, a care plan, therapeutic assessment and intervention, um, and having a flexible holistic approach as well. Most definitely using outreach. So again, as I mentioned, we meet the young person where they're at and then involvement in group work or the Discovery College. Often these are just education sessions for young people, their families, 
um, might be stress management, might be um, sport for the young person or art. Um, and then we also decided that at some point there would need to be an expansion of the program to include intellectual disability um, and ASD program, primarily because, as I mentioned, um, they would need a more tailored approach because often the reason that they are using the violence sometimes can be quite different. Um, and then the early intervention um, vocational component, which would primarily be working with um, education providers um, and even very young children, so those under the age of 10, to try and see if we can um, change or increase social emotional learning and change the behaviour before it becomes violent. Um, I won't bother going through that one because I think I've pretty much covered what the intake process would be. Um, the family focused sessions, as I mentioned, often it's one off. Often in those sessions, there's four to six clinical staff, two hours duration, and it's a network approach. So that means um, the adolescent, the parents, um, whoever else, it could be friends, family, whoever else is involved in that network of, of that young person. And then for the at-risk early intervention families, um, we felt that um, one of the best approaches would be to, um, again, this was a pilot project, 30 young people and their families in single sessions, um, family being referred by an external provider, getting a brief intervention, um, consultations with staff, and also having peer workers, which we found is a really important model of care for us. And then with the later intervention or more complex needs, we felt we could, in the pilot, we could tackle up to um, 20 young people and their, their families to see if we could get some results from that um, and case manage them, but also um, educate the parents around safety planning and um, how to manage aggression um, in the home. So, these were the proposed outcomes of what we were hoping to achieve. Um, decrease in violence, increase in emotional regulation, increase in collaboration and joint care. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this um, sort of fell over because of COVID um, and we continued to see if we can pursue some funding to get a pilot program up and running, which has not yet happened. So that was the original plan. Um, so by this stage, we would have had a pilot program, which would have concluded and we would have had results to um, evaluate. But um, as I mentioned, that just wasn't meant to be. The world had uh, better things in, in plan for us. Um, so where to from here? Uh, funding, I guess, is the biggest issue. The other issue we found is that um, there's a lack of um, forensically trained psychologists. And so trying to find staff to um, manage these types of programs has been a real challenge for us. Um, we need to address the stigma. Obviously, as most of you would probably know, it's highly underreported as to how much adolescent um, violence in the home is actually occurring. Um, there are some areas where there's gaps in service provision and that's due to catchment areas. Like obviously there's a higher need than there are services available to manage these young people. So um, we don't have all of the answers yet at the moment. Okay, so that concludes the first part, which was the pilot program. I am very conscious of time. I've already done a lot of talking. Um, but now I want to actually just go through um, the arm at Alfred Health, which is called our Youth Forensic Specialist Service, which is quite a mouthful, which is a community forensic um, youth mental health service, which was originally funded by the then Department of Health and Human Services, now just the Department of Health. Um, and this was an, initi an initiative um, that was brought in, I think I put it on a slide somewhere, I think it was about three or four years ago. So we ran an evaluation on this one um, and it actually has shown to be quite successful. So what we found is that um, in the evaluation of the young people that were coming through, so we did quite a, a lot of work around um, young people that were presenting, but also we needed to look more broadly again at the literature. So youth mental health, young people in Australia, generally 14% um, of young people in Australia have mental health issues, but young people who are involved with youth justice, it's a huge amount higher, 49%. 
So the Youth Forensic or the Community Youth Mental Health Service, um, Forensic Mental Health Service, that should be, is uh, Victoria's divided up into two, basically. So we've got the south east of Melbourne, which is managed by Alfred Health and Alfred Kims. And then we've got the northwest of Victoria, which is actually managed by um, Origin. So they offer um, primary and secondary consultations. And I'll actually show you at the very end of the presentation around um, how you could refer into it and who can refer into it. Um, the service has actually um, changed quite a bit since it was originally its original inception. Originally, it was intended for primary consultations from Kim's CAMS within Metro Melbourne and secondary consultations and secondary consultations um, and secondary consultations for everybody else. Um, the need again was quite high, and so now they do accept um, secondary consultate primary consultations and secondary consultations more broadly, um, and that obviously showing that there is a great need out there. So this is just a bit of a snapshot of what the community um, forensic youth mental health service looks like. Um, it's slightly different between Alfred and Origin, and we've actually had a slight staff increase since, um, since this evaluation was done. Um, but there's approximately two, two to three staff for the whole of the southeast of Melbourne and two to three staff for the whole of the northwest of Melbourne, which clearly is not enough. Um, in the 18 months when this was taken, there had been um, almost 200 referrals, so about nine referrals a month. Um, most of those were for secondary consultations. So that's um, clinical staff wanting to get some ideas around whether or not a young person should be discharged from services or um, whatever it might be, um, generally some backup. Um, and they really got through the, the um, consultations quite quickly. 12 days from referral to consult, it's actually, um, it's actually probably a bit less than that. Um, but that was sort of averaged across the Alfred and um, Origin. So when we did the evaluation on this particular program, we were looking at to see if whether this forensic youth mental health service was accessible to people, whether it was effective, whether the, it was appropriate, whether it was efficient. So it involved a um, data audit on all of the data that we'd collected on the young people that had come through the service. There was also a customer survey for referrers, parents and young people, as well as interviews, so qualitative interviews. So this is just some of the data that we came up with um, from doing that file audit. So as you can see, um, although predominantly it's males that have um, that are um, using the violence, the females tended to peak slightly earlier. So I think they were around 16 years, three months, and the males were closer to 17 years. What we also found is that there was a huge overlap between mental health issues and behaviours of concern. And I have to find the definitions for the behaviours of concern. Um, and then we had to define what we meant by mental health issues. So mental health issues um, in this instance would have been um, things like depression, psychosis, conduct disorder, borderline personality disorder. So that was how it was defined by the clinical staff. Neurodevelopment would have been cognitive impairments such as autism spectrum disorders, um, ADHD language. Um, unknown might be that we just could not work out. We didn't know enough from the referral. Um, then we've got substance use, so that could be alcohol or illicit drugs, and then intellectual disability, so primarily where there's a low IQ and it was seen as, as a, a um, subcategory for this particular evaluation. So these were the three top behaviours of concern um, that were coming through as referrals. So as you can see, violence was by far the biggest. So the violence was defined as an act of aggression or battery, um, which could cause injury to another person as a result of that act. And often those were to family members, siblings or intimate partners. The threat to harm or kill, although it sounds very similar, was actually where there's a verbal threat to harm or kill others, including threats of mass violence, but no actual act has occurred. And then um, sexual offending was 10%. There were some other smaller um, offences such as animal cruelty, fire setting, um, stalking, um, but they, the numbers were quite low. 
So just some of the key findings, just to give you an example, that um, a lot of the referrers were seeing um, not huge amounts of young people, but the, those that they did see, they, had, they didn't have a lot of confidence in treating some of them. And those that had been a clinician for less time had um, less confidence in general. So I won't read over those, but I think um, what it shows is that when referrers could get some support for these types of issues, they felt a lot more confident in their own role. So we also asked them, the clinicians, um, what changes did they see in the young person? So they often found that there was um, a positive change in the young person with engagement, positive change in their mental health, positive attitude towards changing their offending behaviour and an actual reduction in their actual offending behaviour as a result of having either that primary or secondary consult um, with a um, forensic psychiatrist or psychologist. And it changed the anxiety for the young person um, as well as the referrer. Um, okay, some of the challenges that we identified in this is the workforce issues. Um, it's a rare set of skills is what someone said because um, having someone with a forensic youth, youth forensic background was particularly unusual. Um, often a lot of forensic psychiatrists, psychologists tend to go into the adult system and so there's a bit of a gap in the, um, the youth sector. Um, also this is, although the programs now have been going about four or five years, a lot of people still don't know about it. So um, certainly for the staff within our service, getting referrals to them was initially quite slow because they nobody knew about them. Um, okay, we might skip over that. Uh, okay, the future, should it be expanded? Yes, the good news is that since um, this evaluation was done, uh, it has actually managed to expand. We still don't have a lot more staff. I think we've got about one and a half more EFT, um, but now they are accepting more primary referrals. And also the plan is that there will be a treatment arm at some point. And I think that will be off the back of the Royal Commission into Mental Health since it was acknowledged that this is an under-resourced area. Um, and that's what we've been pushing for all, all along is to get a fully fledged community forensic youth mental health team that supports young people supports the families and also supports other clinical staff across the state, in particular those in rural areas where there is a lack of resources available to them to get that support. Why do we need it? There's a significant need. Uh, the young person was felt to get a much better service. It's beneficial to all of us um, and for the kids. Um, Often the, the clinicians felt they got different perspectives, different strategies, they could lean on expertise, and it was also a shared responsibility if they felt a little bit nervous around it. And also to reduce the risk of being in the justice system for that young person, which as probably most of you would uh, acknowledge that um, that's what we want to avoid. It's better to try and get that early intervention for that young person. So I just wanna go through a case study of this young person who is called Ashley. So this is, this is a typical um, case that um, might be referred to um, our youth forensic service. I'm just gonna put the notes on it. So Ashley was a 14 year old um, non-binary young person with ASD and emergent um, borderline personality, conduct disorder and social anxiety disorder. They were put into residential care following an incident with their brother. Um, where they held a brother, a, a knife to the brother's throat and threatened to kill um, the brother. So as a result, they were put into out-of-home care. But once they went into out-of-home care, that violence continued then with the staff. So there were several incidences with the, um, the carers within the out-of-home care and also the co-residents. And there were, became regular, regular um, threats of killing the carers. Um, and also there was an assault on a, um, an ex-partner, which included punching and strangulation of that, that intimate partner. So clearly the, the care team were absolutely exhausted. They were completely frazzled. They did not know um, what to do with this young person. So what the team came up with, so our Youth Forensic Specialist Service, 
was that there were multiple factors um, at play for this young person. Some of it was around social cognition. Some of it was around very rigid cognition. Um, they were unable to understand the motives of um, others um, and get, as, as a result got rejected by their peers. Um, the boundaries by staff um, were not being met, so the, the staff tried to put boundaries in place, um, but actually believed that they didn't need to fulfil those boundaries. Um, and if they did, then the staff weren't meeting their needs. And so that also resulted in violence and property damage, um, physical violence towards the staff and also fire lighting. So the care team came up with um, a plan to enable some um, open communication and make sure that everybody was on the same page um, for Ashley in order to be able to get effective treatment. So the outcome of this was, was to re-engage Ashley in education and pro-social groups like the local LGBTIQ plus um, group was recommended. Um, it was also um, recommended that Ashley be informed of that it's actually illegal to kill people and that they would be charged with a crime if they continue to make such threats. And also um, the staff had the benefit then of getting the specialist knowledge, which increased their confidence. There was also education for Ashley from um, what was suggested through the fire, um, fire brigade to actually educate them around fire lighting and the implications of lighting fires. So what um, the recommendations that came out of that case um, for Ashley was around, um, sorry, no, let me go back. Recommendations for community films as a whole is um, gaining referrals, keeping communication open so they can get the referrals, developing the workforce, not just the workforce within our forensic team, but also broader workforce development and education across other services. Um, guidelines and reporting and its service expansion, which as I mentioned is, is currently underway um, slowly but it's underway. So where would you get support if you needed to get support? So um, I couldn't actually find the information for Origin but certainly intake and referrals for South East Melbourne is through Alfred Health's Youth Forensic Specialist Service. The email address is there on the slide. So those that can have a direct um, relationship often with, um, with our FIM service is Kim's Camps Youth Justice, children's court and so on. But we also do take, or they rather, take referrals from um, Youth Parole Board, Child Protection, they have done primary consults with community bodies, um, other non-government organisations like Anglicare um, who work in that space, um, Friends of Care and Dual Disability Services as well. So depending on what the severity, I suppose, of the actual incident or the case is would depend on whether that um, the referral was then for a primary consult with the young person or a secondary consult with the staff. But um, the plan was always that this would be offered broadly um, to Victoria, rural Victoria, um, Metro Victoria as the need occurred. And that is the end of my presentation. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, that was, yeah, really quite insightful, actually. And I'm sure that a lot of our audience from the child and family service sector, which is, um, I think, the bulk of the audience today, um, is always really happy to hear from professionals in other fields just to kind of enlighten us on, you know, even some of those contact details, but just how the system kind of operates and the services um, more generally. So thank you so much. Um, someone's just, um, this is not a question, but someone's just popped in um, a comment saying, great to hear that um, a treatment arm is likely forthcoming, um, which is good. And look, I, I just wanted to say that I think the amount of work you've put into that proposed um, sort of model of care um, is phenomenal. There's so much thinking and you're right, it is an entirely complicated and complex issue. And um, yeah, so the thinking behind that has been um, Fantastic. Um, a couple of people just wanted some um, just some clarity around a couple of those points. So I think you mentioned that there was in the proposed um, family focused session, there would be four to six clinical staff. Is that four to six 
staff yes, with that's a family. Four, four, four to six staff, not necessarily clinical. So you might have a peer worker, a family peer worker, but the whole idea is it's a 90-minute session. It's really intense. It's a reflective space using something, I, I don't know how many people are familiar with open dialogue, but that sort of approach to it where it's a an open communication and a reflective space. And that is actually a model that is currently used at Alfred Kim's anyway. Um, so for maybe not four to six staff is probably slightly less. It's probably more about three or four. Um, but for us, that's a model that we use. Yeah, excellent. Um, and uh, a related question there is, could this pilot be something that is staffed and trialled by other broader allied health members rather than just psychologists or is the model very specific to no 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 I actually health? was going to go through the staffing and I've, I've missed that off one of my slides the whole idea would be it'd be multidisciplinary so there would be um, social work OT psychology forensic psychology forensic psychiatry peer workers family peer workers so the whole idea was it would have which again is the way Alfred Kim's currently works it, we work in multidisciplinary teams so that would be the plan the original um, pilot also was to engage some of the not-for-profit organisations to actually run certain components of it. So not that all of it was going to be encompassed with it under the Alfred auspice, um, but that some of the, it would actually go to, say, for example, Anglicare to run a group session or whomever, the task force doing some art sessions. So um, primarily knowing that there's no way as one service we could probably fulfil that entire um, pilot because it's pretty big. Thank you. Um, just flicking through some other questions, just in relation to that model of care. Um, someone has asked, would the focused family sessions try to occur before intervention orders are applied for by police? Often police feel um, like they have no other risk management strategies other than intervention orders, which is not always beneficial for the adolescent and family. Yeah. Totally agree with that one. The original plan had been that um, because we had Magistrate Goldsworthy on board, and um, if anyone knows Magistrate Goldsworthy, um, she deals a lot with adolescent violence. The whole idea was that rather than putting an intervention order in place, she would actually refer the young person to the service um, to try and get some intervention in place so that we were trying to alleviate um, that issue of intervention orders. So it was going to be still I'm still hopeful it will get off and running fairly complicated um, but certainly getting buy-in from um, the police and the magistrates was a number one um, priority. Thank you yeah I think you'd have a lot of supporters if you do get any opportunities to try and um, get it up and running again. I periodically um, still get phone calls from youth justice going how are you going and I'm like yeah I'm still fighting for funding. <laughs> Um, a, another question, this was in relation to the Forensic Youth Mental Health Service, just regarding that um, graph around the presentations of young people, and someone has said the low substance use figure was surprising to them. Was there a lot of dual diagnosis with the mental health group that you know of, or do you have any I more can, information about I don't. Have, I can only go off what our file audit told us. Um, with um, substance use, but we actually have another service at Alfred Kim's, which is mental health and intellectual disability in youth. So often some of those, if they've got an intellectual disability or even sometimes ASD and ADHD, they might go through that service where we know there are actually quite high instances of violence as well. Um, there, I do have the data on dual diagnosis as well, I don't have it at hand, but um, yes, that is another key component. There, there was a lot of dual diagnosis um, as well. Yeah, and that's certainly something that we've, you know, we've spoken to practitioners before. Not, not a universal concern that um, drug and alcohol is always a concern, but that for a certain subset of young people using violence, it's a, a definite concern. So, um, yeah, possibly some other... Um, webinar ideas. We might look at trying to get a bit more of a discussion going on that. Um, excuse me while I scroll. Um, I can see there's a question there about insights regarding the community-based ABIF program, the um, Family Safe Victoria funded. 
That one was really interesting. Um, we did want to put in an application for that particular branch of funding, but I noticed there's someone here actually from Peninsula Health. So um, what we found is Peninsula Health actually, for, for the Alfred, Peninsula Health actually um, is the treatment arm for our particular catchment. And so we couldn't actually, as the Alfred, apply for funding because um, the funding actually is with, within Peninsula Health. The problem with that is, of course, as most people will know, that young people are not very mobile. Like, so unless they've got access to public transport, um, if they wanted treatment, they'd have to get down to Frankston to be treated by Peninsula Health. But most of our young people can't get to Frankston. So um, unfortunately, it's it's the way the, um, yeah, the way the, all the catchments work, which um, can make it really challenging, especially when you've got young people that are very transient as well and can move between catchments. Um, and that's why some of them sometimes are falling through the gaps. Thank you. A um, couple of questions um, were just regarding, and these are these are big questions. They're not easy questions. I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> Just some questions regarding how we could maybe move toward earlier points of intervention. Um, uh, yeah, so someone has asked um, using an early intervention lens and given the wait lists and issues related to clinical mental health access um, for, for all people, but um, can be especially for young people. Can you offer any words of wisdom to support young people using violence in the home when presenting with mental health issues requiring specialist supports immediately? What do we do then? Yeah, that is a big question. Um, I'm not sure I actually have a clear answer on that one. Um, obviously, the purpose of us doing this scoping project was to try and address that as an early intervention in um, upper primary and early secondary um, so that we didn't actually get to the point where you then needed to actually have intervention. Um, my recommendation would be that there is the Community Forensic Mental Health Service. Um, it is available. So um, often they will just do a phone consult with someone to say, you pose the problem, you're referring, you pose the problem. They will get together. They normally get together as a team as well. So you'll normally have the benefit of a uh, forensic um, psychiatrist, Adam Deacon, and then um, three forensic psychologists. And normally at least two of them would attend that meeting to give you a consultation on where they think or what you should do with that. So that would be my recommendation. Um, but again, it's all back to funding. Thank you. Yes, and we do we do field a number of questions generally about um, how we can try and position that service intervention at that younger age point so that we're not having to rely on, um, you know, crisis related interventions yeah. later in, in those teenage years. Um, there are a few more questions, but I think just given the, the time frame, we might begin to wrap up. But noting that some of these questions, um, you may have some insights and um, some, some valuable responses. So possibly what we can do is um, look at providing those questions to you. And if you have any um, written answers you'd like to, to respond with, we can pop those up um, when we send a link to the video of the recording, if that's okay. Um, so for those um, who, who have asked yet, yeah, we will try and pop this uh, video recording up and send a link around to everyone who registered and we'll get that hopefully early next week for you. Um, I'd like to thank, um, a huge thank you to Michelle for presenting today and all of her insights and, and wisdom. And thank you to all our participants who tuned in. Um, please note, um, we, do, um, we do really rely on feedback. So a short survey will pop up when you exit the um, the Zoom session. If you could fill that in, that would be greatly appreciated. And uh, we will be in touch with um, further links to recordings and further events. So thank you, everyone. Have a fantastic Friday. Thanks, Carol.